Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr, and I'm going to be joined again today by Pastor Isaac Crockett. Today on this program, and next week in part two, we're going to tackle one of the greatest challenges to America today, to the American church, to the American home, to the American military, to freedom in America, and this is what we're talking about, is the state of the American male. So whether you're a man or a woman, young or old, you'll want to stay tuned to this very important program. One of the saddest developments of the last 50 years is the broad exodus of men from the home, the forsaking of their wives and children and other God-designed duties that men were created to fulfill, the breakdown of current society as evidenced by such things as the wandering pursuit of so many men as they seek fulfillment in some fantasized version of manhood or an addiction of some type as glamorized in the media, or the fact that the culture has reached the point of vilifying the masculine man as toxic masculinity. All of these have set the culture into a nosedive. Now the question is, is there an identifiable cause to this fact? Is there a solution to this devastating decline? From the perspective of the secular gatekeepers of society, they seem not even to care. But for most people, they still do, and they long for a return to, to, to civility, to true chivalrous and kind men and feminine and wholesome women. Fortunately, there is a solution, but that solution does not come from education, psychology, pop culture, or the entertainment industry. That solution is identifiable, though, and it is proven. It is sure. And like all deep-seated and transcending cultural issues we deal with on this program, the Bible does hold all the answers to all problems of all people in all time. That confidence stems from what we refer to as a biblical worldview perspective that embraces the following four principles. There is God. There was a creation, an act of God. There was a fall where sin entered the world, precipitated by the devil. But there is redemption and restoration through Jesus Christ. So in this program, and part two to follow next week, our theme is this, of God, men, and truth. And with the help of a special guest, we'll reintroduce the concept of God's design for the man, the husband, and the father. We'll discuss men and God's expectations. We'll identify the greatest men silencers. And we'll conclude with what we can do to restore the men who keep their promises and fulfill their duties to God and others. Our special guest is a former Los Angeles Police Department officer, author of the book, Rise of the Servant King, and chairman of the board of Promise Keepers, Mr. Ken Harrison. And with that, I'd like to welcome to the program right now, Ken Harrison. Ken, thank you for being with us on the program today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. I appreciate it. Ken, we have a lot to discuss uh, in these two programs, so I want to get right into it. Um, I know that um, we're going to talk about your book here in the next segment, but you've been in the military. You've been a police officer. Um, you are now leading what I'm going to call a reconstituted, re-energized promise keepers effort for men. Mm -hmm. But before we get into all of this right now, I would like you just to kind of rate, if you could, like a, a grade, if you're given in a school setting, of these three aspects of men in America, to give us a sense of what you feel to be the state of men in America. These are the three areas I'd like you to rate on a scale of like A meaning excellent, F meaning fail. This first one, on matters of character and integrity, number one, Number two, leadership in the home, society, and church. And then number three, the understanding of the American male as to their role in providing stability and security in the home and society. What would you say, Ken? Well, I don't think you can give it anything less than an F. I mean, how could you say that we're, we're doing anything but failing? But I don't say that as a condemnation to men. I say that as a condemnation to our leaders and our scriptural understanding. So, so you look at how much things have changed over the past hundred years. You know, for the history of mankind, men and women had to come together in towns and little communities in order to survive. You had to have someone who raised the cows and killed the cows and cooked the cows and someone who made the horseshoes and on and on and on. 
So you had to have interdependent communities. Men came together doing surviving together. With the Industrial Revolution that went away, then you had all these major wars, World War I, II, Korea, Vietnam, where boys all pretty much, regardless of their class, had to go to the military where they learned how to be men. In this last 50 years or so, because the Persian Gulf Wars don't really count, you didn't have a major amount of society going, you have boys who haven't matured going straight over to college. And we see the epidemic of boys going to school at 18 and they're homesick and they want their mommy back because they have not had to learn how to be men the way we have from the beginning of time. So we're failing because we have a, a fatherlessness, we have an immaturity, and we have a lack of men. It takes a man to make a man. We have a lack of that going on in society. We have a lot of boys without fathers or without good fathers going straight to college where they have zero supervision and they go there and they learn how to party and whatnot. Mm. And it is, we see women and children suffering as a result of the immaturity and how long it is now taking for boys to become men in our society. Well, Ken, you've set it up. You basically have given a failing grade, you say, um, yeah. to men across the spectrum of what they should do. But we're talking about culture as a whole. When we come back, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to talk with Ken further, and we're going to get the, the reason that he was led to write a book, a recent book, that is entitled Rise of the Servant King, which speaks directly to the, man, the issue of men and where they need to go and what they need to do from God's perspective. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, where our theme today is of God, men, and truth. We're focusing on the state of men in America. Our special guest is Ken Harrison. He is the CEO and, promise, uh, and chairman of the Reconstitute, I'm going to call it Promise Keepers, because you may remember that name from long ago. Uh, but uh, we'll talk more about that specific piece, but the focus here is men in that regard. Ken, let me start right out with you here. You just rated where men were. I'm not going through that, basically a failing mode. So we've got um, only uphill to go, I suppose, I hope from here. But you wrote a book, a recent book. It's called Rise of the Servant King. I just want to focus on a couple of things at this point. Um, you, you, you used the word servant, she said, mm -hmm. rise of, so we're going to go back somewhere, but servant and king. I'm curious as to what you are building into that and what a standard you are seeking to establish by the use of the word servant and king in this title of this book. Well, we're called to be kings, each man in our own sphere. And, and part of the problem in the breakdown is that men have lost their identity. Is who are they as men and who is it that God expects them to be? And God calls us all as men to be leaders in our sphere. So if you're single, it is your job to stand up for justice and truth around you to make sure you're out looking out as a man of God for those who are the least of these, right? Um, if you're married, you're responsible for the state of your marriage, for the spiritual state of your kids and your wife. It doesn't mean, here's careful, it doesn't mean you're at fault because some things are, happen outside of your control. Jesus is the ultimate, right? And many people reject him. And so I hear men, men can sometimes hear this and say, well, I've got a terrible marriage, but I'm doing everything I can. And that, that sometimes is the case. But you're responsible for your marriage and for doing all you can. As a servant, Jesus is the ultimate leader, but he came as a servant. He never saw anybody as above him. He never saw anybody as below him. He treated everybody as an equal. And that is how we are to be. Ephesians 5.25 says, men, 
love your wives as Christ loved the church. The church is Christ's bride. And how did he love her? He was tortured to death for her. And that needs to be our attitude towards our families and our marriages. And I'm telling you, if your wife knew you cherished her that much, it would make a big difference in your marriage. Ken, it it is so good to have you on the program to talk to you. And I love how you just took it right to Jesus Christ. Everything goes right back to the cross. And right there, you're talking about our role, you know, as a husband, how Jesus shows that uh, to to the church. And I want to go back to this idea of even a father or a man. You you made a quote um, earlier in the program. You said, uh, it takes a man to make a man. And uh, when we go all the way back, as you refer to, you know, even God creating man in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26, it says, God said, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth. Uh, so God created man in his own image and the image of God. So we see that it, it took, uh, God made, you know, man uh, in the image of God. But what do we look for as far as expectations? Um, what is it that makes a man a man. Um, what is it biblically that makes a man a man if we're you know, seeing this lack of uh, a father, fatherlessness, uh, husbands you know, that aren't standing up to being husbands? What could you point to biblically where we can say, here's the expectation? Well, let me answer that in two sides. And, and the, part, the last part, what makes a man a man, I think you'll be surprised how easy the answer is. But in the first side of it, we have two creation accounts in Genesis 1 through 3. And we're told God created male and female in his image, a completely masculine man and a completely feminine woman. Remember, right after it says that, it says the two will come together as one flesh. Those two coming together as one flesh through sex, right? That's what makes us one, is the representation of the image of God. And that is why Satan is attacking gender so much right now. He he started off with uh, marriage way back in the day, uh, then homosexuality, sexual perversion, and now gender, because if he can mess with our idea of who we are, identity in gender, then we, he messes with our idea of who God is. So we must stand firm on the foundational truth that there is male and there is female. What makes a man? Easily said, accountability. A man understands that he is accountable for what's going on around him. And if you get that simple truth, things are jacked up around here. And a, and a, a non-man says, a male who's not a man says, somebody should do something. A man says, what do I need to do to make it better? And we as men of God need to understand that we cannot make our way to great manhood, masculinity on our own. It comes from the grace of Jesus Christ. How do we do that? We have to know scripture. What's destroying us, what's destroying masculinity right now is that men don't know the word of God because our pastors are not teaching us the word of God boldly. It's become too much of a business. But Again, it's accountability. So if my pastor is not teaching me the word of God, or if I can't find a good church, which I hear so often, I'm still responsible to study his word, to meet him in prayer and say, Lord, show me your word. Hmm. Ken, this is great. And, and this is so helpful. And it seems so simple on one hand, but it is, it's very profound as we you know, start to dig into it. Just so, like the gospel, right? Yeah, yes, right, exactly, yeah. Right. And it all goes back to that. And that's, such, that's what's so good about this and so exciting is that there is good news about all of this. And so you know, we, we see that there is a God and that God created and that he even created male and female in Genesis chapter uh, 1, verses 26 and 27. He makes man in his own image. He makes male and female. It, it seems pretty simple, but it's, it's been convoluted over the, <laughs> over the years through sin, through uh, satanic influences. But now as we move on from there, we talk about speaking of satanic influences. In a biblical worldview, there's a creation by God, but then there's the fall uh, that is uh, precipitated by Satan himself. And, uh, and then, of course, Adam and Eve falling into this trap of sin, and we have all then likewise followed after sin. So... Um, Oh, because of that, because of the depravity of man, how do we embrace a biblical view of, of man, this accountability that we need, and uh, this idea of a servant king? How does this affect us in a depraved world, which, as you've already mentioned, we, we actually live in? Yeah, you know, it's funny because we're going to talk about promise keepers in a bit. And I know a lot of people are, are waiting patiently to hear about promise keepers and what's going on. But, there, you know, one of the dangers of promise keepers, because one of the questions I get asked is what happened? How did it fall? Is that we lost who and why we are and who is the promise keeper? Because we're not the promise keepers. Jesus is. Jesus makes the covenant with us. And it's that covenant is dependent on a couple of things, right? Um, belief, 
that the Lord God raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9, right? Um, repentance. That is what our side is. If we think we're going to get together in a giant stadium and we're all going to say, okay, we're going to try a lot harder, which is what the church has descended into, we're going to fail. We have to understand that we have one thing that will make us promise keepers, and that is dying to ourselves daily. That is laying down our rights to ourselves every day, picking up our torture and cement right across and saying, God, today I will serve you. Just today I will move. Not getting ahead of ourselves and not getting behind because Satan is always there to try to pull us into the past. You failed every time. You can't be successful. Or, oh, look at the future. There's Look at all the stuff. that Look at all the worry. Uh-uh. God is in the now. We live as men in the now, knowing we're fallen creatures, knowing we have an enemy who is constantly whispering into our ears about the past or the future and saying, no, I will keep my eyes on Christ. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Ken, um... I'm going to let's bring a couple of these things together now. We've described the state of the American man and the culture. We're all kind of wrapped up in this culture that's moved away from God. So we've got a lot of problems. That's clear and that's obvious. Uh, you were led to read the, to write the book Rise of the Servant King. We've talked about that. The model is Jesus Christ as perfect servant, but as king, model for the man. Um, You've said a number of other things here. You've talked about the promise keeper idea, which you are leading that reconstituted effort now. But you made it very clear that the promise keeper, the perfect promise keeper, is Jesus Christ. So again, we're right. back, we're back there again to the focus. <laughs> Put right. a couple of these things together. I, you were, as a police officer, I know, you saw a lot of things on the ground. Uh, Isaac has talked to you about the depravity of man and how that is just warred against the model that God has built in to man and what ought to be at creation. Um, move together now a couple of the motivations that perhaps you had from what you saw on the street, what you were seeing as it was impacting men and the culture and the writing of your book and Promise Keepers. I mean, you're, you identified lots of problems, you identified some solutions, work these things together if you could right now as we further talk about the state of the American male, but offer a little bit of hope. In the next program, we're going to talk about some causes and some real bigger solutions, but put these pieces together right now if you can. Sure, absolutely. I've seen the effect of sin in its full bloom glory. So when I was a police officer, and it was South Central Los Angeles. It was Watts Compton area. It's where all the rap music comes from. It's, uh, you know, what people think of when they think of the ultimate ghetto and the gangs and the Crips and the Bloods. It was all that stuff. And I saw what happens when sin is full in full flourish. I also saw what happens when you have fatherless boys roaming the street with no one to teach them God's word, self-control, unity, interdependence. You had a bunch of massive egos. And we see society now, 30 years after I was a police officer, moving in that same exact direction of fatherless boys not being taught the basics. And we have adults now, men at my age in their 50s, who have not been taught what the basics of God's Word said. And you're right, we keep going back to Jesus Christ because that is the foundation. We're sinners saved by His grace. We can take no credit for it. But I often tell that story about the intense training we got on the LAPD on background on situational awareness when you roll up to a 211 in progress a, a robbery in progress what's going on in that robbery where's your bad guy what's the background if i get to shooting where are my bullets going to go is there anybody behind him and all those things are going through a police officer's mind in a moment and i talk about the first shooting i was in on the lapd when i had an arrestee in the back of the car uh when my partner was in the back with him and i saw a car parked uh, the driver, blood all over his face, and I saw a head down behind him, and I saw that there was something going on. He yelled, gun at my partner, jammed the car to the curb, and out jumped a bad guy with a 38 in his hand, got in a foot pursuit, we got in a shooting, and he went down. And afterwards, the homicide detectives came up to me and said, oh, you know, explain what happened. I did. They said, tell me about the second shooter. I said, there, there was just one guy. There was just one shooter. They said, no, there wasn't. And they played me the tapes of all the witnesses. This was a drug hit. It was a professional hit man. But there were two guys, and I got so focused on the guy that I suck it out with a gun, I never saw the second guy that got out of the car and ran off, who easily could have come up and shot my partner and I in the back of the head. 
situational awareness. We get so focused on what's in front of us and we see as a state of men today that we're obsessed with, I got to get more money, I got to get the better Volvo, I got to move to the better neighborhood. And we're not seeing that the world is falling apart. So for those of us who have the truth of Jesus Christ, we must understand who we are and rescue men from their their single-mindedness, their narrow view, and say, fellas, look at Scripture. We got to wake up because, man, they're taking eight-year-old boys and feeding them drugs to inhibit puberty because they're saying they're girls. Just stop and think about the insanity of that for a minute. Who's going to rescue society from that? The men of God. We either are mm. or we're just going to cower. What, which one is it going to be? Ken, great, great way to conclude this segment. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back, and we're going to summarize this program uh, and give some further specifics as we look ahead then to the next program where we go much further into, deal, into context of how we actually got to this perspective. It's pretty amazing. We'll be back in just a moment. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of WBPH Philadelphia, positively different television. To watch archives of this program, go to WBPH.org. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap as we talk with our special guest today, Ken Harrison, and many of you have been hearing about him. Some of you maybe have read his book or have seen a little bit about what's going on. But Ken, I, I just want to ask you to, to kind of give us some, I mean, we've talked about the bad news. And, and this, to, to understand right. the good news, you always have to understand the bad. And we have to start right. with, you know, what God created and that it's no longer what he said was good because of the fall of man. We have this depravity that's pulling on all of us. And so the men out there that maybe are struggling or the wives or mothers who are saying, that's, you know, my dear, you know, person in my life, this man in my life that I wish he could get his act together. We can't. We need God to, to change us. And maybe there are people who God is working on. But just giving us, can you give us a summary? You're, you're the chairman of uh, Promise Keepers. You've written this book. Could you talk about maybe your book and your ministry of what, um, what's going on to help to change, you know, what's going going on in the depraved world in which we live. Yeah, I mean, what you just described, we're, we're living in Romans 1 right now. Not only are we sinful, but we're actually glorifying people who are sinful. And the ark is like Romans. Paul makes this brilliant argument about how terrible we are. And then he says, oh, but thanks to God for the grace of God. And there's therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, he says in Romans 8, right? And then he goes on from there. This is a state we find ourselves in now. The book really is a bunch of some hair-raising LAPD stories, um, pithy short chapters because I want men to be able to read it, right? And the the epidemic, the the most mail I get is from women, not from men, and we get hundreds of emails a week, if not thousands, from women saying, "My gosh, someone's finally standing up and saying this." Not that there are not other great men, godly men saying this. But somebody with a national platform who's not a pastor is standing up and saying, guys, we need to get involved. So the book really goes into restoring our identity, and it's pretty harsh. It really is all about dying to self. That's what we're going to do at Promise Keepers next July 31st and August 1st when we get together. We're going to have the greatest speakers in Christendom. We've already um, determined who they are, but we haven't announced them yet. Although we did it leak last week that Jonathan, or that uh, Tony Evans will be one of the speakers. So. We, we know Tony is out there. He's going to speak. But we're going to call men to who are they in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not adequate to keep their promises by themselves. They need the grace of Jesus Christ. They need to die to self, turn away from their sin, and repent. That's what it's going to take to restore the church and our society. Ken, um, thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to next program. And ladies and gentlemen, we've referenced the book. I want to make that available to you right now if you want it. You can go to info at pknet.org, and that information will be on the screen for just $15 plus shipping. That book can be sent to you, and I want to encourage you to be able to do that. Well, thanks for, for being with us today on part one of God, Men, and Truth. We're looking at the state of the American male. Not good, can be better, 
And if we pursue and do what God says can be great because that's God's model. And that's what we want for all of you who are watching, whether you are men or women. Our concern as men is that men be godly men acting as God designed. Well, thanks for being with us today on this program. Uh, uh, write to us, let us know that you're watching, uh, communicate to us, and pray for us that this program can continue. Join us next week for part two of this program.